because DLC can only be bought by people who already bought the game. But so your audience is already capped limited to yeah. your existing audience, right? And it's only it's only going to be a subset of that. Yeah, that's a good way of framing it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. All of the latest Marvel things have just been DLCs. That's what yeah, they felt the, like for yeah. the Marvel IP. <laughs> Butterscotch. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 375 of Coffee with Butterscotch, the game dev comedy podcast of Butterscotch Shenanigans. I'm Seth and I'm the games programmer. I'm Adam and I'm the web programmer. I'm Sam and I'm out here. Uh, this is a show where we talk about life, <laughs> businesses, working in the games industry. Today's August 5th, 2020. And before we get started, we have a warning there's going to be profanity in this show. So if you like that kind of thing, you're in the right place. Yep. Uh, we'd also like to thank our recurring supporters over at moneygrab.bscotch.net, uh, whose money we recurrently grab. Mm -hmm. Is that a, was that a word? Recurrently? Yep. Uh, it's, it, it is now. Like it is. Recurringly, recurringly? Recurringly. Anyway, we keep grabbing it, man. That's great. Uh, all I right, think it's guys. recurringly. That seems more right. Recurringly? Recur recursitrant. That also sounds wrong. I don't know. Words. <laughs> it's not. It's not recursive because uh, then it would. We would create an infinite money loop, which, which would be great. I, I'm okay. Yeah, okay mm -hmm. with that. that sounds mm -hmm. good. That's like that actually does happen to you if you if you overdraft your money from a bank, right? Because then they're like, oh, overdraft fee, and then they're like, uh -huh. oh yeah, sorry, uh, you can't pay us the overdraft fee because you don't have any money, so we're going to charge you yeah. an overdraft fee, and then all the that's, how banks, mm -hmm. that's how banks. That's how banks. Like all, all, literally all of their money. Actually, little known fact. Mm -hmm. Well, that every and scam every dollar. Those are kind of the two core operations. Yep. Destroying yep. the whole economy <laughs> and getting our tax dollars. You know, those are, mm -hmm. which is a pretty. But, but is it really a scam if it's so complicated that nobody even knows how it happened? You know. That's a good point. Yes, it is. Yeah, yes. I think it still is. Uh, all right, let's talk about let's talk about Talon. What so yeah. last, I think. All right, we talked we talked about it last week, right? Uh, a few weeks ago. Who knows? At some point, we talked about Talon. Talon is this voice software for power users. So instead of using your hands or your feet or however you normally use your computer, you can use your mouth. You could yell at I it. Mean, I mean, by speaking, not like <laughs> tonguing at it or something. Yeah. Uh, we smooch so you. Can, no smooches. Yeah. Uh, so Talon is 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 uh, one of those tools that I find pretty annoying because it's made by programmers for programmers. So yes. they're like, "Fuck you, you figure it out." That's just what it says. Like mm -hmm. that's yeah. the slogan um, of everything made for programmers by programmers. Yeah. Uh, so we did that. We spent Friday, all of Friday last week, figure trying to figure out Talon and trying to find come up with ways to. Uh, you know, write little scripts and do things to see if we can add voice voice layers into the ways that we use our software and the way yeah. we do our work. Yeah, we should say uh, that what Talon was originally developed for was was as an accessibility tool for programmers who were unable to use their hands either at all or very much. So the goal was to be able to do whatever you needed to do, no matter how weird and complicated, basically. Uh, using your voice. Um, and so that's yeah. kind of the origin. Um, and I think when we talked about it, it was because uh, on our team, Jen had gotten a finger injury and so she couldn't type like at all or use yep. her mouse very effectively. And so so she needed a tool to do that. And she had looked a bunch of stuff up. I'd heard about Talon before also. And so she figured out how to kind of make that work. And then I was looking at what she was doing with that. And I was like, this seems generally useful, you know? And in the same way that a keyboard hotkey is mm -hmm. useful, right? Um, and so the the motivation for the talent jam was to say, this seems like the whole team could benefit from being able to use voice as part of their workflow because the stuff that really makes you, you know, a power user, quote unquote, right, is knowing a million hotkeys, having like lots of ways of moving between your programs and often having lots of programs open at once and, and you know, most... Mm -hmm. Most yep. programmers have a hundred Chrome tabs open at the same time for all of the details they were looking up because they're like, how the fuck? Yeah, it's just so for all the stack. Yeah. It's all the Stack Overflow. <laughs> yeah. or, get, or GitHub is mostly where I'm at. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> there's just like ton, you're just at tons of uh, you're just doing a lot of stuff and trying to move back and forth between these places, and uh, you want it to be just as easy as possible without a high cognitive load to do that. And it's a lot easier if you can say things like focus Chrome, as in make Chrome be the thing I'm looking at on the computer right now. 
and just have that suddenly happen versus alt tab, alt tab. Oh shit. Oh, that one's Chrome white. Now I've got, but which one is it though? You know, it's hunting like, for it on your desktop. Yeah, hunting for the so that, bar at the bottom, you know? Right. And that was the motivation. As I said, it's, you know, it's made by programmers for programmers. So it's uh, not a very, it's got a high barrier to entry. It can do anything, but you have to make it yeah. do anything. And so we wanted to take a day just to give everybody the best chance possible of making use of this tool and, and also letting us all kind of figure it out at the same time so mm-hmm. we can help each other. Yeah. So uh, I, f- I had a pretty good time with it. What did I didn't you go, I didn't go manage to do with it. You know, what, how did you integrate it into your workflows and stuff? Mm-hmm. So I tried, uh, you know, working with like a bunch of these sort of like window navigation things, but it turns out that um, I'm not a typical programmer because I'm a game maker programmer. Yeah. So I pretty much have game maker open <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and the problems I have, nobody has. So I don't have Stack Overflow open or anything else open yeah. uh, because if I have a problem – you're all problem. alone in the wilderness. <laughs> I'm yeah. alone. Yeah. I'm either I'm either emailing YoYo Games or uh, the game maker team, being like, "So this weird thing happened that nobody's ever seen before. Uh, uh-huh. What do we want to do about this?" Right? Um, or I'm just working around it in Game Maker. So so instead, my focus was on looking through some of the kind of boilerplate things that I tend to do, to, you know, in, do in my code. In other words, things that I have to rewrite in similar ways a bunch of times. Uh, so for example, if I want to do a, a for loop recursion, which is just a way of kind of like having a thing repeat a bunch of times, you always type it out the same way. Uh, you know, it's like four and then a parentheses and then you write, you just write a bunch of shit. And then you got to fill in the blanks, right? So I set up my uh, talents that I can just I can just say for loop, and it'll type out all the boilerplate stuff for me, and then put my cursor back to a point where I can just start filling in the blanks. Um, and then I kind of just took that concept mm-hmm. much further, and I and I was just any any time I would run across a function that I uh, tend to use with any amount of frequency at all, um, I would just go and add it to my talent configuration. So I could just say the name of the function and it'll just, it'll just type it. Yeah. Well, yeah. this is particularly cool for anybody, any other programmers listening who use, uh, pr- who use editors that have snippets because the thing that Seth described of like, I have this common pattern, I want to reuse it and I need to be able to like have it spit out most of it and then like put me in the right spot to do the next thing. Yep. Right. And so uh, lots of other editor tools have, have this kind of thing built in. And even to the point where they'll like they'll let you tab between like the parts. It's almost like it's a form you're filling out, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and so, so what Talon basically let Seth do was just implement that in a in game and in, in a thing that didn't have it, right? But even if you do already have it, like in my case with Visual Studio Code, uh, I have to assign a hockey to it, right? Mm-hmm. I have to like, I have to remember how to get to it. Um, yep. And so I have actually built over time, like a bunch of really nice little snippets for my own stuff, but then I'd never use them because they're hard to get to. And so that's the cool, the other cool thing with town is that you can, it allows you to implement things you previously didn't have access to in a way that you can remember. Cause you can just say words, right? It's semantic. It means something and it just happens. And you can take a thing that even if you could technically do it required you to memorize a whole bunch of non semantic information, like hotkeys, right? Key combinations, then all of a sudden you can just say the thing that you're trying to do. And it does. And it does the thing that you're trying yeah. to do, right? Yeah. It's so there, much easier. And there were a few features in Game Maker that I tended to uh, to not really use, even though they did have hotkeys. That's because the default hotkeys for them were so awkward. Like I think uh, there's, they have this bookmarking concept where you can set a, a numerical bookmark by pressing a hotkey and so anywhere in your code. And then you can jump back to that bookmark by pressing some modified version of the hockey. So I think it's something like control and then a, a number across the top of the keyboard and then to set it. And, and I, th- I think anyways, and then to <laughs> jump to it, it's like control shift and then some number. Well, right. you can't hit control shift and then a number at the top of the keyboard without either being some kind of concert pianist <laughs> or using, or using two hands. Right. Yep. And so, uh, game maker actually did recently add the ability to customize hotkeys. Mm-hmm. So I could have solved that problem kind of recently by trying to change those hotkeys. But at the same time, uh, that's another problem yeah. because now you've got to figure out what to assign them to that isn't already in use by something else, right? So instead, I was like, well, what if 
I just don't give a shit what the hotkey is. I just set up talents that when I say set bookmark one, then it oh. just hits the it just hits the hotkey no matter how awkward the key combination is, uh, and it doesn't matter to me anymore. So I don't have to worry about conflicting hotkeys wherever I just say what I want to happen, and then it just happens. Yeah. I think this is uh, this so is that's been pretty is, great. That's one of the big. Uh, there's a lot of latent power available in the tools that you're already using that just due to the constraints of being a person with, you know, a limited working memory and also just sort of the habitual stuff going on. Uh, it's very hard to actually fully access all the stuff, all those features that someone's built into a program. So like GameMaker has snippets, actually, but the way they've set them up is a little awkward such that you can't. Yeah, just, you, you've got to like right click and then mouse over a menu and then hit a button. Yeah. So there's, so, there's no direct hotkey to get to the snippets. Yeah, yeah. So instead of having to, yeah. you know, find that out and then be bummed about it, then you can actually still basically get that functionality out of the program. But then even more, I think functionality that is built in that does have accessibility, in terms of these like bookmarks or else, but that due to just the other stuff that is required for you to function properly in a program being other hotkeys, uh, you know, what you tend to be doing normally, that you just don't end up making use of it because adding it into that kind of rotation is just too much. Uh, that's where I think the some of the real weird extensibility of your tooling from talent comes from. It's not really from doing special things. Uh, it's just from doing things that you otherwise have a hard time doing, typically because of submenus and stuff like that. So like mm -hmm. what I had spent a lot of time on Friday, and I'd already talked a little bit about managing layers and stuff like that, which is a common problem for digital artists um, in, in talent. And so actually I popped into an art discord uh, over the weekend and showed some friends talent. And like what I'd managed to do with it for layer management. And they were just pumped out of their minds. <laughs> One person just immediately downloaded it and started, and I showed them how to set it up and stuff. Um, and then I got, you know, I got a, a note back from him like two hours later and he had like fully voice controlled adding like animation cells and stuff <laughs> like that to uh, Clip Studio <laughs> Paint. And I was awesome. like, oh, actually I need that because again, it's one of those things where like I have, there's certain keys I use a lot for managing, moving, scrubbing through a timeline and stuff like that. But basically you can think about it like, if layers are a stack or you're, you're, you're a rows of things you have to deal with, then as soon as you're dealing with animation, now you're also dealing with columns of things. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It is this rows by columns from like, how do you navigate? How do you just like, can I just say, put this there? Uh, how do I specify which one of the things in the rows goes in which slot in the column, all this stuff. Um, and so I did a, a bunch of those hotkeys uh, without any true purpose, but just cause I saw this guy do it. Um, and then this past week I already got to make really heavy use of them when I was doing some uh, mockups for the Crashlands 2 dialogue system. Where usually, if I'm doing that, I have to basically as soon as you assign like a cell in Clip Studio Paint, it kind of it always defaults to running that cell all the way to the end in terms of time. So instead of just filling one yeah. slot, it's like it kind of goes all the way to the end of the movie, basically. Uh, and so I, you know, remap some stuff to be able to just say last frame, and then it just doesn't fucking do that, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And even like saying yeah, so choose from cells, and I could just pick whatever one. As opposed to having to right click. You know, like all this stuff, um, or even yeah. rememorize some new hotkeys and stuff like that. So yeah, it's good. Yeah, the thing about this that I I have found the weirdest is that, uh, and, and I, th I think this is just sort of a um, it's an evolutionary problem where like computers, all they had was keyboards at the start, right? And then like the mouse came later, and then the ability to and, like microphones came later, and then. Uh, like most computers had enough memory to hold a sound file, right? <laughs> or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, nowadays we even have stuff like eye trackers, right? Like there's, this, there's these pieces of hardware that can track your eye movements, right? And it's just sort of a, it's a given that your computer comes with a mouse and a keyboard, right? Mm -hmm. Does it have a microphone? Does it have an eye tracker? Does it have these other ways of sort of reading your inputs? No, it doesn't, right? Uh, and so it's it's been a weird experience to see like just how uh, once you have these kinds of things set up, all these voice commands and stuff, just how intuitive it is yeah. to just interact with your machine in that way um, and how much faster and easier it is. And it's, it's typo free, right? Like, if if I have a snippet that I'm using that I've you know to write to write a, a chunk of code that actually is like 200 characters or something right like a big chunk of code I would normally have to type each of those out and there's always a small error rate mm -hmm. right so not only am I typing it out potentially giving myself you know a repetitive stress injury by just 
type, 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 type. And then I also have to make heavy use of the backspace key to just like go back and clean things up, right? And so so now I can just say what I want to happen. It's like, and it's just there. Perfect. There's no mm-hmm. problems with it at all. Um, and then I can move on and focus more on the things that I want to do. It's weird that that's viewed as an accessibility tool. Yeah. As, as in like, oh, this is just something for like people who can't use the superior method, the keyboard. This is, <laughs> this is, this is just, this is just a bridge. It's a bridge to get you there so you can ac- access the thing. Right. right. Um, as opposed to really, it's a, it's a huge multiplier is, yeah. is what it is. Like it, it allows you to do stuff so much faster, so much better with, with a lot less thought. Um, and it's just kind of a bummer that, that there's not an obvious way to just make voice commands just be a thing that well, programs just have. It's just, well, yeah, you know, yeah. Part of it is also like if you're getting like a – you have to keep in mind the context too, which is like people are working remote now. But previously, like the big thing from the last 20 years was these open freaking concept offices, right? So like – I would not in my life be like, yeah, let me pick up some voice <laughs> command stuff so I can like be yelling at my machine <laughs> in the context where also, you know, and I've had it happen where I accidentally leave town open and then uh, my wife will pop in and I'll chat with her for a second, not realizing that town's listening and trying to do stuff and, <laughs> you know, come back and mm-hmm. there's just like a bunch of windows open and all sorts of things. And you could, yeah, you could fuck some stuff up pretty good on accident. Oh, yeah. Because uh, it's really hard to accidentally hit the keyboard or the mouse and make something bad happen because it's so hard to make things happen with those two devices. You have to do it very intentionally. And most of the things that you do with those devices cause nothing to happen. Right. Mm-hmm. But yeah. with, cause the, the, the problem with voice activated stuff, like voice processing stuff is it's just really, it's a really hard computational problem. Right. So yeah, it's been mostly not possible because it's just such a hard intractable problem. And we didn't have the processing power. We didn't have, the years and years of, of research to like figure out strategies and stuff, you know, and it's getting to the point where the stuff's getting quite good and it can be run on, on modern hardware of all kinds. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's still, there's, there's a handful of things that it still and always will really struggle with. Cause if you think about like the input of a mouse and a keyboard, there's no semantics there. That's you directly mapping. Yeah. Like an, and you have like the letter A is in my mind and then it's you touch the letter A and that's, <laughs> right. that's what happens. Yeah. Right? Except sometimes you'd be like the the number seven is in my mind and you press seven and you're like, oh, fuck, I, I had numlock turned off. Yeah, yeah right. Whoops. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because, oh, because yeah, it's, a, it's a <laughs> direct six, five interface. and four. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a direct interface. You're just mapping the inputs that the computer's going to get, right? Versus a voice-based one, especially when it's that you're trying to send commands in, right? Where what it's going to do is it's going to look through the library of things that it knows about and then what it heard you say and then try to find something in there that seems like it's a good match after it does its processing, right? Yeah. And so that means then that the things that it can do are are fully described by that set, but also that it's that it it's biased towards making something happen. Yes. Right. right. Yeah. So but then especially because like the of the overloading problem where you'll you'll map things that are easy to remember. So you'll be like, like in Sam's case it was like set sell something right Mm -hmm. so you're going to use words that you normally use which means if you just start talking to somebody especially if you're in a meeting talking about the stuff you're working on because then you're using the same fucking words oh yeah yeah if you're so there's just the amount of stuff that can end up happening so it's it's, that's sort of a the evidence of how useful it is because it's just doing stuff right very fast very effectively doing complicated things with just a spoken word right but the reason is, is because it's taken that that layer of abstraction away, so you're not doing direct inputs. You know, I wonder because like some of the the sci-fi novels and stuff like that that we've that I've read, including the uh, more recently the the Murder Bot series, they talk about That's people so speaking uh, sub vocally, right, for their like talking to mm-hmm. their to themselves, but it's actually basically doing this kind their of their implants. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, it's one of the things I was wondering about. Where I was like, I wonder if part of it is almost like a, if you included basically a volume threshold feature or something like that, where it's like. You know, while I'm, because I'm not, I don't, ideally, I don't have to yell, you know, rasterize to, to get talent to do stuff. And so it's yeah. like, if you were talking like a normal person like this versus essentially somehow quietly talking to, like, and there's some threshold where then it doesn't, you know, I mean, like it doesn't start doing stuff unless the volume's at a certain yeah. level. But the problem is, of course, your low volume is lower information, so it's harder to yeah, find. I can't pick up the Sweet. words. Because uh, you can't like mumble into the microphone and have it actually know what the fuck's going on. Yeah, well, um, and I think it. I think the, one of the fun things about it is it demonstrates also so much how much of like, 
Because as soon as we put semantics in, because when it's a keyword and mouse, you're just like, yeah, this literally means the letter A. You don't, right. you don't expect it to do something else, right? When you are looking at your computer and you want to do something, and then you say the thing that you're trying to do, like like move like move the cursor down three spa- three lines or whatever, like you'd have a short hair for that. But if you said something like that, you had a very specific intention in mind of a complex set of things that required a whole bunch of stuff to be true, right? Which is that that thing is in focus. Your cursor is in a certain spot. The thing processed that information correctly and then moved it down in a way that you expect, right? And when you start, when you start like using something like talent voice, you start to get a sense of just how, how much the rest of the inputs that we're ignoring, like where your eyes are, what your, mm-hmm. and your mental model of what you're trying to do, how much that isn't there, right? Because once you go past the direct input, which is you've already done all the work in your own brain and then sent the inputs to now only doing part of the work in your brain, right? No, it's true. And then being like computer, figure out the rest, right? Then because like, how often are you looking at the screen and you think that you're looking at the focused application, but it's the, the actual application and focus is something else. Mm-hmm. So you start typing and it's like, oh shit, it's over there, right? Yeah. So, so like, that's one of those things where it's like you had a clear intent there, which was to type into that window and you're looking mm-hmm. at it because that's what you're gonna do. But where you're looking it's is not an do input. anything. Let's yeah. take it into account. Yeah, you know, I think it's interesting about that well, though, too. Is, is that there's a feeling I got from working with it now for about you know, two weeks or so, which is that I was, I'll give you an example. It's like of this idea of basically meant, you're basically end up doing completely different things to achieve the same result, depending on whether or not you have access to this thing or not. So a simple example is if I wanted to like switch back to discord from clip studio paint, so I could type a chat note or something like that. Um, previously, all I would actually like sort of the command that I would send to myself is like, is basically search the task bar. Mm-hmm. And that was basically it because sort of like the what I was actually trying to go for, it's almost like walking to the kitchen to get something. Like what I was actually trying to go for uh, is not, I don't get to choose exactly. I had to go hunt for it anyways. So it's like holding that in mind the whole time seems dumb. So instead I just look at the task bar, basically use the icon of Clip Studio, of Discord to refresh the idea that like, oh yeah, I wanted to go over there and then do it that way, right? So there's this weird thing that happens. I don't know if it happened for you guys, but like there's a bit, it feels a, a little bit, uh, slower but also i think more intentional because you basically have to say you think for a moment about what you're trying to do and then you actually have to you basically fully execute the command as opposed to these sort of partial stepwise things that are all yeah. designed around producing cognitive load that would be there from manually doing well it. i think you're sense. yeah i think you're, you're exactly because I, I find that also that's the hard part of like using talent yes. is like is i'll be like i know what i want to do and i'll sit there and i'll be and i'll compose the words in my brain to make it happen and by the and by the time i'm part way through i'm like what do you what was i trying to do right but which is that's a fluency problem right that's, that gets yeah. better over time um but you're right that like your normal process and, and this is exactly what i wanted to is like i realized was like my one of my core uh issues i guess just use, doing my workflows is that moving between things, whether it's like parts of one application or between applications, or in my case, I have four virtual desktops on my computer, each one with its own project, kind of with like, it's got its own, got its own Chrome running, got its own uh, uh, code editor running, right? So I can have like all my stuff related to one project in one window you know, and so on, right? And so, yeah, I, just, I know how to, I know what I'm trying to do, which is I need to go to my project for working on my main code problem, right? right? So, but to do that, it's like, okay, I have to hit, I have to use the Windows hotkeys to move left and right between desktops, right? And then just watch so I can like mm-hmm. see when the familiar stuff appears, right? Yeah. So presumably the same you as you're do. describing it's the same deal, right? It's like yes, you look down the taskbar, actually... you're like Discord, and you see it. So you're yeah. you're always searching. Yes. It's search, step, it's, search, it's step, search, step, search, step. Yep. Yeah. And so it, we're trying to trade all of those searches, get rid of those and replace them with you Clarity. know exactly what you're trying to do. <laughs> yeah say that up front and then have the thing happen. And that's exactly what I also noticed and have been trying to do. And, and I've found to be the most, the most obviously out of the gate useful for me has been navigating what I'm looking at on the screen because, because even on one screen, it's like alt tab again, try to find, try to find the thing, you know, but I've set it up so that now I can, I rename my Chrome windows and like in my code editor windows, I have a certain naming convention. So I know what they're going to have in there, you know, and so now I can just say like focus Chrome uh, Talon, and then all of a sudden I'm looking at my code editor for my Talon scripts, right? Mm. Or I'll say, uh, or I guess I have focus Chrome, so I'll be looking at my Talon research in that case, right? So focus Chrome Talon to look at my Talon research, focus Code Talon to look at my Talon code, mm. right? And it doesn't matter where it actually is. I didn't have to do any searching. Yep. I just had to remember I'm working on the Talon project, my Talon stuff, and I need Chrome 
and I need code. You know, it's one of those two things that I'm going for. And all of a sudden, like that, that by itself, yeah, reduced so much cognitive load uh, that it's been really quite great. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, a weird thing. it's been it's been nuts. So yeah, definitely check it out. It's, it's called it's called Talon Voice. I think is actually the full yeah name of it. Uh, yeah. So what's the? Do you guys remember the URLs? Just I Google think it's it. talentvoice.com probably, but um, just Google yeah. it. Yeah. So Google again, it. though, it's like out of the box. It doesn't really do anything. Um, they do have some documentation there of some like pre-made packages that you can pull down to get kind of get started and look at kind of how to put together some little um, files that you can start describing even just basic hotkeys, you know, in different applications and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's been kind of a game changer. And I think it's something that... Um, will be just kind of continuously ex- like expanding on over time in our toolkit. Because, yeah, it's it's been kind of interesting to me, especially seeing something like this that is so obviously useful mm-hmm. uh, once you start to get into it, but so underutilized. Yep. And it's been kind of weird to me in retrospect how, like, there's so much hype around shit like cryptocurrency and virtual reality <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. where it's like those don't enable you to do anything new. They're just sort of um, a different way of doing something that we've already been doing the whole time, but not necessarily faster or better or whatever. It's just some, it's just something else. Mm-hmm. Right. But this is like such an obvious boost to so something that everybody that, does that, all the fun. Some, yeah, yeah, something that you're already doing, yeah. uh, and it's just so un, like under invested. But like you're saying, Adam, it's it's a it's a processing problem, it's a teaching problem, it's a context problem. It's also like a product problem. It the reality is, office, you know. Yeah, the reality is like as a as a product, uh, like you're saying, it's it's currently not produced in a way that is uh, is actually accessible to anybody who doesn't know how to at least knock around in. Oh yeah, it's it's you know? primarily made by one guy right yeah. and uh it's it's a ha- like a half open source project um there's so there's a there's a the beta version has all the coolest latest stuff and so i don't even i don't even know what is in the regular version um but this guy's he's just supported by patreon right so yeah, it's crazy we're just, you know? we're just having the studio yeah. pay him some uh patreon dollars and then so we could onboard all of our team to the beta version right but uh like that's that's the whole model right which is which is which is also great because a lot of the people that need this are people who do need like actually need the accessibility that it provides but this is like we've been talking about this it's come up a lot lately is that the accessibility we just always treat as something like for people who need something right and accessibility is a is an alternate way for somebody who can't access it normally yeah, as, and opposed, it's always as opposed like, to a you boost have to it or everybody. you don't. Yeah, exactly. And it's and it's, yeah. and it's just whole like yeah, it's like you got it or you don't kind of a kind of a model. When what it's really about always is about progressive and enhancement, right? And progressive improvement and basically progressive access, but as importantly, ease of access, right? And so yeah. whether we're talking about in games, whether we're talking about it in websites, like whatever it is. It's basically accessibility is trying to meet the people where they're at, right? Yeah. Via design, via features, so that the people, wherever they're at, can actually engage with the thing in a way that is human, you know, that, that's human centric. It's so like direct inputs using a keyboard, you know, yeah. Well, if you're a human who spent a lot of time getting really good at typing on a keyboard, then it's accessible to you, right? And you can make the, and you can increase accessibility for keyboard users who are mm-hmm. right. really good at using a keyboard. And you can and you can do that. It's still accessibility. That's still like a, improving that process, right? Yeah. And so I think I think part of the uh, there's a lot of reasons why like accessibility gets kind of just thrown to the side. Um, Literally, I mean, yeah. In the real world, what you see is like two steps coming into the entrance of a door, and then a wheelchair ramp going off to the side. Yeah. It's like just just have a ramp. Why do yeah. you have stairs and a ramp? <laughs> Ramps are just as easy for anybody to walk up as stairs. And you don't need two different ways to get in, you yep. know? Don't put it off to the side. Just make it the, the way to get in there. It's yeah, easy. just make it the way. Get, <laughs> but yeah, this thing is, is just so much of accessibility is just better for everybody, right? Or yeah. having the option is better, right? Um, yeah. So, I, yeah, I don't know. I think it's, it's, it is an interesting thing. We just kind of keep falling into this interesting collection of questions, right? And they all get lumped under the umbrella of accessibility, which really just means human focus, you know? Like, tr- trying to meet the person and make things make life good. But that's, that's also a lot of why we've been focusing on just the developer experience. What does it mean to do your work? Mm-hmm. Which is all about how easy your tools make it, which is again, all about accessibility, right? Mm-hmm. 
Well, let's let's talk about a little s- sort of accessibility thing from yeah, Crashlands so. Two. Um, mm-hmm. uh, all right, so little here's a little Crashlands Two sort of a uh, recap and update on kind of where where things have been for the past, I guess, year and uh, some change. Eight, ten, eight months, something like that. Ten months. So, uh, when we started working on Crashlands Two, we basically thought of it as it's like a sandbox uh, for us as developers, where we basically said we want to prioritize making it really easy for us to do lots of experiments. So, we learned this from Levelhead, where Levelhead is a game built around a level editor. That's that's what the game is. But it turned out that having a level editor made it super easy to add new kinds of things to the game and also to do QA testing because our QA team could exactly create the scenario that they that they found a bug in or whatever and then just sent you know upload that level to our development server and just be like here uh this level's broken and you, it's so easy to yeah, it's the same so. idea in programming where people always ask for a minimum reproducible code example, right? Where the, as in like, I can take that tiny piece of code and I can run it on my machine and I get the same problem mm-hmm. so that I can understand everything about where it's coming from. Yeah. So in Crash and Sue, we're like, okay, well, we want that. We want the ability of, of our developers and our QA team to be able to create test cases and sandboxes and all that to test new features and whatever. So we created a developer tool called, it's just called the workshop. Uh, kind of named after the level head workshop, right? Mm-hmm. Um, where we have a world editor, we can go in there and we can, you know, hand build uh, worlds. We can place terrain and buildings and creatures and you know plants everything. and trees, you know, everything, everything that's in the game. We can just put it in there and create all kinds of different scenarios. Um, and we can upload them uh, onto our server and we can download each other's worlds. So that way we can test stuff out. We can show bugs and replicate things and all the all the good stuff that we had with Levelhead, right? Uh, so this has been pretty cool, except for one core problem, which is that Crashlands 2 isn't Levelhead. Mm-hmm. Crashlands 2 is not about... Uh, about creating a, a like a specific you know like obstacle course or whatever, and and then uploading it. It's about a, it's a story. Right? It, there's a story to it. There's a shared world to it. It's about having the, one consistent world that everybody experiences instead of yeah. a million worlds that yeah some sub so experience. so for example you know it, it, what we're trying to do is we're, we're trying to create the feeling of a real place right and so. It, so that means that, you know, if we have some specific kind of creature or plant or whatever, there's a certain way that we want the player to experience that. Uh, so they'll find this kind of a creature, you know, in this kind in this particular ecosystem or, you know, whatever. Um, but none of us have been able to directly experience the actual intended way that the game is supposed to be because we can just take that creature and just put it wherever we want and we can put however many of them we want. So it's... So the balance is weird, right? Um, and that also comes down to things like how hard is it to craft this item or how hard is it to, to obtain, like, you know, meet this objective? Well, if if you just, like, are able to just get the best weapon in the game and there's just, like, a hundred of the resource that you need to craft it just right there in front of you because that's just what you put there in the world editor, right? Then it's incredibly easy to craft that thing. But that's not really what the intent is, yeah. right? So, uh, so we've had this kind of problem all along, where because we prioritized the developer or the development tooling, um, we haven't had a shared, persistent world for everybody to experience and and give feedback on and comment on for what the game really is. But we'll yeah, the, the, the game's we, actual world, right? Yeah, I'll yeah. say that we've had it. We've had it. It's just that you had to go get it on purpose. You had to go. And you had to be a developer. Like yeah, you, you had, had to, to be a developer. Yeah, yeah, because because yeah, it, it we've had, we've had a world that we've kind of sort of like soft, you know, internally flagged or just verbally, like yeah, that's the that's the world that is yeah, going if you to play to the become, game. Play that one, right? Yeah, it's going to become the official campaign, and every other world is just like a, a test world, right? But there was still nothing in the game that hard reinforced that. And also because it's in the workshop, then if we wanted to send a copy of the game to a, a publishing partner or a platform or whatever, you know, to pitch it, whatever, um, 
we would have to, you know, give them an elaborate series of steps on how they could get like developer <laughs> access somehow uh, to to get access to this world, right? So, uh, so this past week we were like, okay, we want to start working on narrative stuff, quests, you know, a lot of these sort of like uh, nuts and bolts of of making a much more deliberate guided player experience, you know, building out the real world. But we still have this persistent world problem, right? We're like, we don't have the official campaign and we don't have a way for people to play it and get feedback on it unless they're a member of the studio, right? <laughs> so uh, so that's what we prioritized this week. Um, and it was pretty quick. Uh, we also had some interesting challenges where like we, we needed to sort of tie it together with what's happening in the game changer and make sure that all the game data is synced up. And there's a lot of like, version management problems that kind of come along with it, which is kind of why we, we put it off. Um, but we've got it now. And so we have the ability to, for the first time, this yeah. after all this time, to actually send a build of the game to somebody and they can just hit play on, you know, on the main menu and be playing the game without having to do anything else. Uh, so it's kind of weird that it's that it's been that long before we prioritized this. Yeah, uh, well, I think that's that's the interesting one. Is like why now, basically? And to me, it comes out of a few things. One is that I think the the core the core shape of the basic loop of the game is like how as far as how players interact with it, how they grow with the game over the course of time. Uh, I think has it sort of got its battle battle test and like thumbs up essentially like you know two weeks ago after we finished this uh, big design overhaul and uh, and uh, did a playthrough right. Where it was like, yeah, this is definitely working. It's like, cool. Okay, so that means we're no longer we're no longer doing so much weird stuff that it's likely that the nature of just how things are is going to somehow be moved laterally in a direction where if it was a save previously, just won't be able to function like under the new yeah. format, right? Which was a lot of the problem originally was that we were moving so fast and then so many zany directions that we were like, we don't want to bother with this yet because it probably won't even matter. Like the guess is that we're just going to throw everything out. Um, yeah. So we're at a point now where the, the game is solid uh, in terms of what it's doing, what it needs to be doing. Um, and on top of that, as soon as you have that, then it's like, yeah, you need to be able to give the damn thing to people for a whole bunch of reasons. Usually in the business case stuff early and then later just, you know, for alpha testing purposes or whatever else once you once you cross the line, which we're, we're not quite uh, up to just yet. But like, you know, we're, we're approaching those, those points where we can do some stuff with it. And so the biggest one for me was basically being able to decouple when to do that strategically from the actual work of getting it to to the point where you could do that, right? So instead of saying like, yeah. "Oh, now we want to send it to publishers," it's like, "Oh well, we got to interrupt." There's always this, there's always this uh, this last step yeah. that we haven't taken yet that would yeah. keep us from sending it. So it was always a question mark. And the thing is, it only took a couple of days. Like it took a couple yeah. of days of us sort of like talking through the the data management and version management uh, design problems. And coming up with an implementation for those, and a couple of days, boom, we've we've got, got all of that stuff done. The world is packed, um, and and also we wanted to make sure that we did it in a way that was much more streamlined than what we had in the, in the past. Because uh, you know, like Levelhead has a campaign, right? Mm -hmm. And we did make this campaign editor in Levelhead, and we used the level editor from inside the game to build all the levels in the campaign, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but packing the campaign was this thing where like the game would go through and compile all the levels together as well as the campaign data, package it all into a, into one file. And then it would just sort of barf that file into a folder somewhere. <laughs> and then it was still up to, up to the developer, in this case me, to go find that file and grab it and then put it into the game maker project, uh, and then commit that and and up, you know, push that. So there was still this weird, like manual step behind the scenes where you'd have to like go and like drag fold files Physically, around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, recently game maker added this kind of dangerous capability where <laughs> game maker, you can optionally enable it to have full read, write access to all of the files Mm -hmm. In the on the computer, instead as opposed to having what kind of sandbox. Yeah, mm -hmm. instead of having it just be able to read and write to its own little folder, now you can have it do anything. Which means that which means that we can have Crashlands two pack pack up the the game data and then package the game data into the project into itself into mm -hmm. its own game maker project, mm -hmm. which is what I've done. 
uh, with some extra testing layers for safety. <laughs> um, but uh, it works that, yeah, it works great. So now you just kind of like you hit the pack button. It's like, boom, progress bar shows up. It does a bunch of validation checks. If anything is wrong along the way, it'll tell you what you need to do to fix it, you know. Um, and uh, it's been much smoother and it's been pretty great. It's, mm-hmm. But like you're saying, Sam, like it was knowing that we had to do all that stuff and figure all that out meant that we never really could even entertain the question, like, should we send a build to these people yeah. or these people? Uh, because the answer was always, well, no, because we got to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, we're kind of, we're kind of laughing about it early this, early this morning because Sam had referred to this, this problem as a bottleneck um, mm-hmm. in our, like in our, Deployment, uh, like deployments, you, or yeah, whatever. Can you get your product to an end user? You know what I mean. Like it's kind of the yeah. question. And, and, and we were, and, yeah, we were kind of joking about it because it's like, well, can you really call it a bottleneck if nothing is moving through the pipeline? <laughs> right? Because like, like a bottleneck is like, oh yeah, like the pipeline has narrowed at this point right, in right. some way, reducing the flow. But if there never was flow through this pipeline, and can't and, be. And can't be, and we ne- and we didn't intend there to be flow in this area of the pipeline it's until now. We just we just sort of like unjammed it. I don't know, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah. So it, so there's a good chance that we will send a build to somebody soon because now that we can, you know, we're just yeah. going to probably. Definitely, uh, I think we still have. There's one more layer we have to solve too, which is the the login layer. And deployment, because there's still the question: How do we get it to somebody, and how do we make sure they have access to the stuff they're supposed to have access to? Right? Because we already have that solved for the development context with the different kinds of users we have, and, but that's all happening like on our development server and all of this stuff. That's where like the game files come from and all that stuff, right? Yeah. So there's always like the more you, the more tooling and cool stuff that you're doing to make like really streamline the development process. That the kind of the more layers of complexity there are between that thing in its developer state and it in its for its intended yeah. audience state. Right. Well, that's, that's the beauty of this packed thing is that, uh, there is no login. Oh, don't like, so just, yeah. yeah, this, yeah. So this was, this was the final decoupling where like now mm-hmm. if we send it, if we send it to somebody, then there is a frozen in time version of the game changer data, as well as the world data that are in sync with each other. Mm-hmm. That are just there and you just hit play and you don't have to log in. You don't have to do anything. Uh, and it's what it's meant to be, right? So now we can start iterating on what the game, what we really want it to be, as opposed to just a bunch of experiments and ideas, you know? Um, so it's pretty exciting. Uh, yeah, I'm pumped. But but yeah, I think we still need we still need quests. We still need stories because... I want to get enough ha- verbal humor in there, written humor... Yeah. It's got to be crash Yeah, because like, mm-hmm. that's, yeah. that's the one piece that's missing. And as soon as we get even just like a just a sprinkling of that, then I'll finally be able to start hitting some hitting some. Oh yeah, and there's like there's so much jank right now because we got we got so many like placeholder things in there. Like like we we want to get fishing in there, but right now you literally just like beat a fishing hole with <laughs> a fishing pole. <laughs> like you just you uh-huh. literally just like deal damage <laughs> to a fishing hole, uh, and like and, and just hit it, and then fish it's explode, it's which. Which is pretty great. Uh, it's pretty great, honestly, but not necessarily what's intended. So we, you know, there's lots of work to do, but you know, that's what the rest of the development time is for. So no mm-hmm. beginning. Uh, all right, now we got time for one question. Let's do it. Okay. All right, this question comes from Ronan Game Dev, who says, "How do you feel about numbers and sequel titles?" Some would say this is all right, it's a bit of a long question. So mm, let me. All right. Some would say that putting a number in your title will ostracize people who didn't participate in the original. Mario stopped numbering when it hit SNES with Super Mario World, except Galaxy 2, which bombed relatively. Mm. Even on the indie side, Hollow Knight Silk Song or Super Meat Boy Forever. Yet there are still franchises that lean into it. Final Fantasy, Resident Evil. Thoughts? If you follow through with Crashlands 2, uh, Crashlands 2 subtitle, it would be legendary. <laughs> Uh, so we did joke about calling it subtitle because there's always a subtitle on sequels. Mm-hmm. And if we called it subtitle, like with a D un- under the tides, mm-hmm. uh, we currently don't have any underwater Things. thing it's happening boring. at this point. Uh, well, we, uh, we might, but we've also might not. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, yeah, I, my, my so, take is like the, the reality is that 
I don't think it matters, to be honest. Yeah, I don't think so. I think whether or not there's a number in the title has got nothing to do with the relative success of the thing. Just yeah. sort of it's just I, well, I think I think it can on margins, but in ways that you probably can't predict either way. So it probably doesn't matter. Because I know, for example, like I, um, the first Final Fantasy game that I played was Final Fantasy X, mm-hmm. and it actually was the case that that I was worried. Actually, no, sorry, it was Final Fantasy VIII, but it was the, it was the case that like. I was worried that I would not understand what was happening in the story and stuff because it's the eighth one, right? And I was like, mm-hmm. oh, God, like, do I have to go back and play through all the original ones? And I'm like, where even are they? Because they're on different platforms and stuff. Um, and I ended up it's like seeing a friend play it and realized, like, oh, this is actually like a fully standalone game that has literally nothing to do with the other Final Fantasy games, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then once I figured that out, then I – played Final Fantasy X without any apprehension as well because it just looked like a good game, right? But that's weird because, like, um, they're not even in the same universe. (laughs) Honestly, (laughs) Final Fantasy having numbers is probably the weirdest. It's one of the weirdest things. It's it's basically like this is this kind of a game. Yes. Right? It's like this kind of, like, story-driven, big team-based RPG kind of a thing. Except then you get into like the Final Fantasy MMO, which isn't anything like the other Final Fantasy games, but it's called Final Fantasy 14. So I don't Yeah, that would I, I mean, a, I don't know. It's just odd, frankly. Yeah. But like I think I think in general, I think it's really just comes down to the question of did did the original game uh you know have a large enough audience to warrant a sequel? And then did the sequel do enough to it sort of enhance and improve the original experience. Because otherwise it's a in stand on its own. Because otherwise it's a freaking it's a DLC now. And the reality is like, what is it what even is a sequel when the reality is that most games now live sort of forever in this weird like most successful games are constantly updated. What is a sequel? Yeah. Well I think How, it's a, is that mean for different, you know? Yeah, I think historically, at least like because the vibe that I have uh, from just playing games over time has always been that what a, what a franchise is doing is telling you is basically giving you a sense of what your experience is going to be like. So if you see mm-hmm. the name of a franchise followed by anything, a subtitle, a number, uh, whatever, um, mm-hmm. then that's like okay, more of that kind of experience. And it also meant from the same like studio, right? right. Although that's not exactly true, right? But it's like true-ish, right? And so if I had a really good time with something, then and then another one comes out in the franchise and I'm like, okay, I'll probably have a good time with this too. But I actually don't mm-hmm. come in with any assumptions about what the relationship is going to be unless I've already played multiple games in that franchise. So take like Fallout, right? Like mm-hmm. I played Fallout 3 and I played Fallout New Vegas. So when Fallout 4 was coming out, I was excited. And I was like, I've got a template because I've seen two examples. Like this is now going to fall into that template. But if I had played like, I've never played any Final Fantasies, but assuming they're all different from each other, if I'd played Final Fantasy something, and then another one, I'd be like, okay, so this is just like, I can see the shape of my experience, right? Yeah. Uh, but there's no expectations I have outside of that when I move on to the next one. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, th- I think games in particular have really leaned on the, on the franchise entry standing alone far more than like books and movies. Um, what do you mean, man? Oh, yeah. As in, like, because, like, you know, like, if you're you don't reading, have to play the previous ones. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah, if, re- yeah, yeah. if you're reading a novel trilogy, right, like, you're supposed to read the whole thing. If you if you start a book three, you're like, who the fuck? What the yeah, fuck? What is weird. happening? Mm-hmm. And and they'll they'll still like you know a good author will still try to like remind you, you know, give you a sense of what's going on here, right? But it's not sufficient if you just literally have not mm-hmm. read the rest of it. Um, and I think movies are a little less of that. Um, because they have such a tight, they're so constrained, it takes so long to make them and, and all that kind of stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so they and they so they try to tell standalone stories, even if they are referencing back and pulling mm-hmm. on stuff, right? Well, and so I think I think like movies and then games even more than that, where the main thing you see with the franchise is similar vibe and callbacks, right? That if you're in the know, you get to feel great because you're like, oh fuck yeah, I know all about this, right? And if you're not, you might not even notice that it happened. But if you did, it doesn't really bug you because you still get what's otherwise going on. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'd say a good strategy or a strategy that I can kind of get behind just like uh if you have something that's that's a fairly direct sequel. So basically basically what our plan is with Crash Ins 2 is it's a direct sequel in the sense that it it follows the same main character and it's mm-hmm. in the same 
place and it has some story continuations from the original. Mm-hmm. But but it is standalone as well in the sense that if you didn't play the original, you're not out in the cold um, because the game will do enough to to get you up to speed. Because also we're gonna, we're gonna assume that anybody who played the original basically just remembers kind of like the vibe of it and not really any of the specifics, right? Definitely. Because yeah. because we don't because our memories are terrible. It's um, been six years. What am I? Yeah, mm-hmm. a genius. Maybe so like- basically, we're saying like it should feel like you're playing Crashlands. Um, but way, way better and cooler and bigger and with like mm-hmm. more, more of the cool stuff that you like plus bonus stuff. Right. Um, which is to me why it makes sense to, for it to be Crashlands 2. Cause also it's, it's sequential, it's chronological, right? Mm-hmm. It's kind of like how in st- like the Star Wars stuff, they did like, they numbered the episodes sequentially based on where they are in the story so that you don't have to remember kind of like where they are in the in the, the timeline, time, right? Yeah. Like, like, did Return of the Jedi happen before or after Attack mm-hmm. of the Clones or whatever, right? So, but then when, the, so then they have basically have like a main branch, episodes one through, I guess, nine now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they've got, they've got spinoffs, right? Yeah. Like Star, Star Wars, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Star Wars, Rogue One, right? Those aren't the main uh, core of the franchise, so they don't get a number. They just get a subtitle, which I think works pretty well. Uh, but I was also just reading about about some problems that are kind of come down the pipe with Marvel. Mm-hmm. Okay, so apparently, like thirty years ago, Marvel Comics started having a bunch of problems with uh, re- retaining viewership be- or like readership because mm-hmm. there was a time where they were really growing and doing really well, and they had a couple of like core characters and like core uh, you know stories that they were telling, they were make, co- making comics about. They were doing really well. And like, you know, comics, they have issue numbers and stuff and they kind of go sequentially. Um, and they started doing more and more um, spinoffs of those and more uh, crossovers where like more and more characters mm. started showing up in the different comics uh, to the point where a new a new issue would come out. And, and it would be sort of incomprehensible to you why you should care about anything unless you had already read – all of the issues yeah, you had of to these like, six care. different ones, right? Yeah, uh, and so and so there was kind of this this big fall off. Yeah, it was yeah. like this big fall off of readership once they kind of got into that sort of o- Ouroboros, you know, like snake eating its own tail of mm. storytelling. Um, and they're they're doing the exact same thing now with all of their movies and shows, where they're putting out so much content so fast, and it's now just all about crossovers and callbacks. That if you haven't been keeping up with it, your your incentive to jump into any one of the stories mm. falls off faster and faster over time because you feel out of the loop. And so there's a lot of people who basically said like, once I saw Avengers Endgame, I was like, you know what? I feel like that's a good like, end that, game. That's, a, that's, that's a wrap for me, mm-hmm. right? Um, and that's kind of how I felt. And then when I went and saw like Spider-Man, uh, shit. Away no, from home, no way home. No, no way. Uh, I think it was away. The most recent again, like since they didn't number them, I don't know which one's the most recent one. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, but so when we saw the most recent Spider Man, which is all about like it's literally just it's literally just crossovers and callbacks. That's the whole movie. No, I hated it. I know a lot of people really liked the Spider Man movie, but I walked out of that so mad because I feel like it would, I had my time wasted because it wasn't a good story. Mm. Nothing that happened needed to happen. They mm-hmm. just made it happen so that they could do crossovers and callbacks. Mm-hmm. Like they had characters who were perfectly fine going along with things and then suddenly just started doing evil stuff for no reason. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they just abandoned a- their motivations, you know, to bring in another character. Like it's just, yeah, it's just yeah, maybe, ridiculous. Well, maybe it's a better a better question than it's like, what what are you doing with, with a sequel? Uh, and are you meeting expectations for whatever the fan base is? And- and potential new fans. I think the problem a lot of people run into is that if you're only making stuff for the people who bought the previous thing, the reality is that it's not. Ever That's a the, shrinking market. It's, it's a constantly it's, shrinking market. It's the yeah. same idea as a DLC attachment rate, right? Because yeah. DLC can only be bought by people who already bought the game. But so your audience is already capped Limited. to yeah. your existing audience, right? And it's only, it's only ever going to be a subset of that. Um, it's less intense when uh, you can still gain because like you can't gain access to DLC without already having a game right mm-hmm. so it's less intense of an attachment rate problem in other media but it absolutely is still there because yeah, yeah if you 
don't have an onboarding. Yeah, that's a good way of framing it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. All of the latest Marvel things have just been DLCs. That's what they the, felt like to me, for yeah. the Marvel IP. <laughs> yeah. Versus like if you you know if you're if you're really pushing and expanding on the idea of it, and especially with an intent to grow the audience, which is what we're doing in the case of you know Crash Teams Two. Um, I, I really don't have a doubt that once people see the thing that. It's not going to matter. You can put whatever you want after the word Crashlands, and I'm pretty sure people are going to be into it. My hope is that Crashlands, the Crashlands to Crashlands 2 jump in terms of like uh, fan recognition and all that stuff is similar to the Fallout 2 to Fallout 3 jump, mm -hmm. right? Where like, like I I had just vaguely seen some of the, the pri like original Fallout games, right? But I was like, I don't know, right? And then when I saw Fallout 3, I was like, this looks fucking dope. Mm -hmm. I'm going to play this. And I never played the prior games, but Fallout 3 looked good enough and it had enough interesting, goofy things going on in it that I just, I wanted mm -hmm. to check it out. Um, and thankfully they did make it a standalone thing where like you didn't need to play the prior games, right? Um, now I'm not, I have no, I have no delusions that we're going to see yeah, the of level course. of success of Fallout 3, but I'm just talking <laughs> about in terms of the, uh, the vibe of like, if people, if somebody sees Crashlands 2 and then they go back and look at the original Crashlands, that like that jump in, in like quality and scope and scale and everything would, would feel like that, you know? Yeah. So more like Half-Life to Half-Life 2, right? And I would bet anything mm, that yeah. a, a huge fraction of, of people who played Half-Life 2 did not play OG oh, yeah. Half-Life, right? And oh, yeah, probably. But if you think about it, like, because what's the, like the first thing that happens in Half Life Two? It's been a while. So I, I've played it a lot, but it's been a while since I last did. Uh, but at the very beginning, like, there's a big deal about you getting your crowbar, right? But not, but not like really. It's just like you meet you meet a character who you've met before in one of the spinoff games in uh, Blue Shift, right? Um, yeah. So already deep cut, like almost nobody, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, but, but it doesn't matter because like you meet this guy, and he seems to know you, right? Yeah. Yep. But there's like, you don't feel like you're missing anything about, cause like I couldn't remember anything about, I was just like, who the fuck? Oh yeah. And I was like, oh yeah, it's that guy, but it doesn't matter actually. Right. So it's a yeah. callback for the fun of having one. And then he throws you a crowbar at the beginning. Right. And makes some little tiny joke as he throws you your crowbar to go off into the world. Right. And that's where and the audience uh, cheers in the, exactly. in the theater. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And and then, Gordon's got his crowbar. Yeah. Yeah. And the new and people are just, like, the fuck? Right. Right. Yeah, cause it's, and it's, but it's so small that if you haven't played the original, you don't, yeah. you're just like, you either don't even notice or you're just like, oh, that's kind of weird. But then you just move on. And then the rest of the game unfolds and it feels like you're playing Half-Life, except everything is different, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, the vibe stays the same. The vibe is the same. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So that's what, you know, that's what we're going for. So as far as like numbers versus so it ah, probably doesn't matter. No. Uh, just just make it. Just try to make it better, and don't oversaturate uh, this everything with being too self-referential. I think mm -hmm. is probably the it's probably mm -hmm. the move. All right. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. I would like to thank our producers, Fat Bard and Sampa De Costa, for putting the podcast together, and thanks to our community moderators who keep our Discord running. To get more involved in the Butterscotch community, just go to podcast.bscotch.net, where we have links to the Discord, a way for you to donate, and links to the archives. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you next week. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye.